On this episode of the Sports Opinions Podcast, the host of Whitaker Sports, Bradley James Whitaker, joins the show as we talk about Damian Lillard's ridiculous buzzer beater in the rest of the NBA playoffs, the first round of the NFL draft, and why baseball is just so terrible at marketing its players. And sports fans, if you like listening to this show, do not miss the Personal Foul Podcast with host Colton Gesser. He has awesome sports content and great guests, same as this show but just another great show to go listen to. And also, if you are a mega sports fan, go to www.overtimeheroics.com slash forums to participate in great sports forums with other awesome like-minded sports fans. So without further ado, cue the intro. What's up, sports fans, and welcome to the Sports Opinions Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Cuesta. As always, with me today is the host of Whitaker Sports, Bradley James Whitaker. What's up, Bradley? Hey, Alex. How you doing? Good, good. Um, anywhere on social media, any plugs you want to give out, people can go find you. Yeah, sure. If you want to watch some of my content, uh, just look up Whitaker Sports on, on Facebook and YouTube. You can find me on Twitter, at the Brad Whitaker. Very nice. So right out the gate, um, in terms of time, you told me that you're over in California, so we had to coordinate this. I'm over in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, so we had to coordinate this. But you then tell me your favorite teams, and they're all Boston. Please, God, at least tell me you're from the Boston area. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am very, very lost. Uh, yes, I, I actually, I grew, I wouldn't say Boston area. I grew up in New England, though. I grew up in Maine, and uh, yeah, I moved out to California a few years ago. I uh, worked as a sports writer for uh, The Fumble, and uh, yeah, now I'm just creating my own content. Well, that makes sense. Maine doesn't really have any pro sports teams. You have the University of Maine, yeah. which I'm a runner, and they have a pretty damn good cross-country team, so there you have that. Uh, you're a runner. I am, too. I ran cross-country in college. I ran track over at Marist. <laughs> oh, neat. Okay, yeah. I went to Trinity College. So I was, you were D1. I was D3, so... Yeah, I might have been D1, but I sure as hell did not run like a D1 runner yeah. at my time there. Um, that's great. Small world. See, runners unite, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump right into things. We're going to start off with some NBA talk. Um, I know you're a Boston fan, but we have to address Damian Lillard with one of the most disrespectful buzzer beaters I have ever seen in my life. He's out near the center logo, Paul George, one of the better um, defenders in the game, really giving him space because nobody but Steph shoots that, and it's 115-115, tie game, coming down to it, and Dame just hoists a giant three, and you saw by his body language, he knew the game was over. Did you watch that in real time? And if so, I feel like every basketball fan is just kind of excited at that point. Yeah, I, I happened to tune in in the fourth quarter. And yeah, that was an exciting game. The Oklahoma City Thunder, they blew a pretty substantial lead in the final minutes. I mean, they it, they kept gaining and then Portland would close, gain and close. And then, you know, Westbrook drove to the hoop and nothing happened there. He just kind of fell to the ground and Lillard knew what he was doing. It wouldn't have been my first choice in terms of shot selection, but Hey, that's today's NBA. You're right. Steph Curry makes that shot all the time. Uh, it was almost, what, 40 feet away. Uh, Paul George even got a hand in his face. I wouldn't say it was terrible defense on George's part. It's just he, he didn't expect it. You can oh, tell. No. I mean, he, no. are you really going to shoot this? Yeah. But, hey, so how do you feel? NBA. How do you feel about the postgame comments and Twitter? It's a little mini Twitter war where Paul George flat out said, I don't care what anyone says. That's a bad shot. And all Damian Lillard responded was LOL. <laughs> it was just fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I were an NBA head coach, I would advise my players probably not to take that shot. That said, <laughs> think of like five, ten years into the future. Think of where the NBA three-point shot was at like ten years ago and where it is now. Where do you think it's going to be in like ten years? People are going to be taking that shot all the time. You know, you got eight-year-olds now at the rec center heaving up threes from half court all the time. Uh, the, the the college players entering the NBA are just far better shooters than they were even 10 years ago. So, yeah, maybe that isn't a great shot in today's game, but it's getting there. And I think 10 years from now, I don't know, what are they going to add, a four-point line? Who knows? But, uh, yeah, that that's a shot that we may see going forward 
a little more often. Without a doubt. I think the four point line or something like the big three is doing where it's a four point circle of the big, um, mm. I think we could see something like that. I think they're onto something there because yeah, you gotta, the, everyone's taking so much of these bigger shots. I think they should at least get rewarded. And it would make the game more interesting because they'd be able to spread out defenses significantly more when there's a guy that can shoot a four point shot. Yes, but the, the old farts of the NBA are going to hate it. The ones that really were not happy when they in, in, implemented the three-point line. I mean, it, it's <laughs> – I, I don't know if you could have, like, a four-point line uh, or, or it, I like the idea of a circle. Uh, what do you think of just extending the three-point line back? Or, or my idea is you, you get rid of the corner shot and you just have the three-point arc – uh, go out of bounds so then you limit the amount of space you have to shoot a three and get rid of the corner three there could be that or i also thought just raising the rim a half a foot you raise the rim <laughs> a half a foot it just makes it sign- uh, great shooters are still gonna be able to be great but a lot of the borderline shooters are gonna struggle and you're not gonna have tiny dudes dunking it's gonna it'll still be a fun game the freak athletes are still gonna be freak athletes lebron on a 10 and a half foot versus a 10 foot rim is not going to be any different um it's a real tricky thing because they're going to have to do something because it's becoming such a different game. And to talk about your point with the old timers, these same exact old timers that complain about the three point line love to brag to their grandkids that they watch Larry Bird. So I don't want to hear anything <laughs> about those dudes because he invented being a three point specialist. So I don't want to hear anything from those old hokies. They just need to. Yeah, but those, those are the people that claim they, it was Bird's passing they liked, not his shooting. Oh, yeah, exactly. It was his passing. And everybody watched Dominic Wilkins because they wanted to see his back-to-the-basket uh, sky hook. Okay, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with this, we've seen this story before with Portland. We've seen Dame Lillard make a great buzzer beater. I forget how many. It was like two, three years ago when he beat James Harden in the Rockets on a buzzer beater. And it was an unbelievable play, sideline play, a much better shot then. But we saw this, and then we saw them stall in the next round. I believe they played the Warriors the next round, and they could not get past them. Do you right, feel right. that Portland can ride this wave with an older Damian Lillard, a more experienced CJ McCollum playing well, and his Cantor, who cannot be overlooked with his offensive prowess and rebounding ability? Can they ride this wave to a finals appearance, possibly? I'm not sure I'm willing to say they're going to the finals just yet. Uh, but look, I'll say this about Damian Lillard. I think he's the most underrated basketball player on the planet now. And that's just because he plays in Portland. I mean, when, when you talk about like, who are the top point guards in the NBA, he's always the guy you overlook. And uh, what that, what happened the other day when he hit that shot, that was a statement from him and people know who he is now. I mean, and not that people didn't know who he was, but they now consider him. Maybe, maybe he's the top three, top four point guard. Uh, but to your question on the trailblazers, I, they have a good roster. I mean, it, it's easy to overlook, you know, they have Cantor and yes, McCollum and Lillard, but you know, there's a lot of good players on that team. Oh, what uh, Nurkic, uh, Seth Curry's there now. I mean, that, I'm not saying they're going to beat the Warriors. I, I don't think they will. Uh, the Warriors have to get there first, obviously, but uh, it, that is a potential six or seven game series for sure. And you, you've heard the guys on NBA on TNT, three, four months ago, they're saying Portland's going to the NBA Finals. Now, I, I tend to take Charles Barkley's predictions with a grain of salt, but <laughs> they are a really strong roster, and I, I think they'll get through the next round for sure. Yeah, they're, they're definitely riding a wave. Now, we're going to go right into your wheelhouse, um, a team in the East that has definitely uh, finals expectations. It's not mm-hmm. even that they want to get there. They believe they should be there. You're Boston Celtics. Um, Kyrie Irving is undoubtedly the leader of that team. And, you know, it's, it's funny in playoffs because you can have great rosters. And when Kyrie was hurt and Hayward was hurt, we saw guys like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown really step up in the playoffs and play very well for Boston. But now that Kyrie's there, he is the guy. And you notice superstars come playoff time, and he is a bona fide superstar. Is he going to be enough to get, the, get Boston past the next round right now when they're playing Milwaukee? with Giannis Antetokounmpo, Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez just looking like the real deal. Can Kyrie do enough to b- build this team up and build these young guys up and win yeah. this without Marcus Smart and with Scary Terry having to step up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, here's the, the issue with the Celtics isn't talent. Um, I, in fact, I think their greatest strength going into the regular season this past year was depth, and that was probably also their greatest weak- weakness because 
yeah, you mentioned last year Tatum and Brown and Rogier, all those guys carried the Celtics almost to the NBA Finals. They they made it to a Game Seven there against the Cavs, and they they really stepped up, and that was an exciting time. And then they had to take a step back suddenly this year because Gordon Hayward was healthy now, Kyrie was back healthy again, and you saw they had a lot of chemistry issues. You know, Kyrie didn't handle the Boston media very well. There was a lot of he still you know, does not. Oh, yeah, no, he doesn't. I, I, and he always loves to talk about leadership when he doesn't actually act like a leader in real life. <laughs> um, and, but again, I have a very love hate relationship with Kyrie Irving. You know, I will every game I tweet, I take back everything bad I said about Kyrie Irving. <laughs> uh, but this this is a team that certainly can match the talent and the players that the Milwaukee Bucks have. Um, I think going into the season, everyone picked the Celtics to to come out of the East, and then they kind of forgot about them because, you know, the Raptors brought in Kawhi, and they were very exciting, and you saw what the Bucks did, and then the Sixers brought in Jimmy Butler. They've had their issues, but they still finished ahead of the Celtics, uh, but now you're seeing, now that we're into the playoffs, I actually think not having Marcus Smart has helped a little, even though he's obviously tough to lose on the defensive end. I think it's really helped players like Terry Rozier, players like Jalen Brown, because they're getting a little bit more minutes than they were getting in the regular season, uh, and important minutes too, obviously. So I think those chemistry issues are solving themselves. Uh, that said, Milwaukee is a tough place to play. They have home court advantage. I, I have a feeling Milwaukee's going to win game one. Uh, they they have Budenholzer as their head coach now, and, and you know he he's, has some experience. So I, I think the Bucs will at least win the first game, perhaps even the second game. But what we've seen with Brad Stevens over the years is game to game, the more information in the playoffs he gets about uh, gets on the other team, the better they perform uh, because he's that kind of a coach. He's, he's, he's like an NFL coach. He's able to prepare game to game better than any coach in the NBA. And uh, I think that's going to be a significant advantage. So my prediction going out on a limb, I think the Celtics are going to lose the first two games and win the next four games. That is a bold prediction. And yeah, Brad Stevens is an absolute beast. And just two things. One, I'm a Brooklyn Nets fan, so I have no, no love for, for the Celtics. But I do have to say, <laughs> I am a scary Terry fan. I, I think Terry Rozier deserves more minutes. I really like what he brings to a team, and I'm kind of happy that he's going to get more run in this playoffs. And number two, I'm, I just have to apologize. Being a Nets fan, I have to root against you guys this series because Brooke Lopez is over there in uh, Milwaukee. And I just want to see Brooke play in the championships. He deserves it. He struggled with my terrible Nets for so many years. And now that the Nets are good, he's on a better team, and I'm happy for him. So um, I like your prediction because I really can see the Celtics, you know, kind of adjusting, figuring it out. And I can't wait to see ESPN blow their lids of how Kyrie's terrible, Gordon Hayward's this, and then all of a sudden they go on a run. Because people forget yeah, Al yeah. Horford is such a cog in that team. Al Horford is literally the glue. He's the Bruce Bowen. He's the uh, Robert <laughs> Horry of that team where it's just, yeah, he's not going to sit there and take over every game, but when you need him, he's going to win. And that's the Yeah, that's he's awesome Mr. Reliable, thing. for sure. Yeah. And okay. So speaking of Kyrie, lots of Kyrie talk here because he's the superstar. Are you going to be watching Kyrie in a Celtics uniform next year? If I had to pick right now, I am leaning yes. Uh, but a lot depends on what happens in the series. I think, I think the Celtics basically have to make it at least to the Eastern Conference Finals for Kyrie to want to stay. So this series is probably going to make or break whether or not he stays in Boston. Now, uh, I'm not – everyone's bought into the idea of Kevin Durant going to the New York Knicks. I, I Apparently, I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, the, the rumors have been flying forever, but everyone it's in the media – It's coming from ESPN. Cool. It's coming from yeah. Stephen A. Smith. It's coming mm -hmm. from that think tank of let's drum up as much rumors about the Lakers and Knicks so our ratings go up. That's all it's coming <laughs> from, honestly. But we go through this every offseason with the New York Knicks. It, it, Knicks fans, maybe it's because they live in New York and they think everyone wants to be in the Big Apple, that every superstar wants to go there and play for their team run by James Dolan. And it, it just doesn't happen. Free agents don't pick New York. They haven't picked New York in a very long time. I mean, maybe you'll get Kemba Walker. Maybe Kyrie will choose to go there. I, I, would, I mean, I would – you're a Nets fan. I would choose the Nets over the Knicks. Why would you want to go to the Nets with Absolutely. all their dysfunction? 
I do have to say, though, the one thing is that the Knicks, what they have going for them is they actually have true leadership in Scott Perry and Steve Mills now. They are Mm -hmm. legitimate basketball guys. You can see that they are running it better organizationally. Yeah, this year was a tough year, but you know what, though? They got rid of Porzingis, which I don't think is a bad thing in the long run. You yeah, let you your young, yeah, you let your young players get runs. You bring in Dennis Smith Jr. with a chance to revive his career. He had some good play for the Knicks late, even though they lost. So there are things working there. And being a Nets fan, I see what they're trying to accomplish. It's just that the fans in Manhattan need to be patient, and I don't know if they're capable of being patient. Yeah, yeah. And look, it's the garden. Everyone loves the ambiance. They love the atmosphere. And it would be great for the NBA if the Knicks were good. And if the Celtics lose Kyrie, it just means they can throw a little more money at Terry Rozier, maybe sign somebody else. Uh, So it's not like they're going to be terrible if they lose Kyrie Irving. And we saw what they did last year. Uh, It would be good whether Kyrie goes there, whether it's Kevin Durant or Kemba Walker or some combination of the three. Uh, yeah, it would be. I want the Knicks to be a good team, but this idea coming from Knicks fans that every free agent wants to play for them, I need to see some evidence first. I want the Knicks to be good, but I want the Nets to be better. So I want them to get better superstars than the Knicks do. <laughs> so admit you admit that the real reason you don't like the Celtics as a Nets fan is because we fleeced you with that Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce trade all those years ago. In retrospect and in real time, it was a fleece, but I will always defend. I'm, I am not a fan of Billy King. Not one bit, mm-hmm. but with the way Mikhail Prokhorov came in, it was either he made that deal or lost his job anyway. He was demanding right. blood. He was demanding results. He wanted the back page, and that was the best offer that Billy King was going to find to bring in the biggest name. So was it a terrible deal? Yes. But was Billy King up against the gun anyway, and Danny Ainge is a freaking shark in the water smelling blood like he always is? <laughs> You know, I I can't defend the move completely, but I see why Billy King did it because he was going to get fired and someone else was going to make a similar move. Either way, the Nets were going to get a move like that. So, And that roster on paper looked great. It's just you added an extra year to Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett, and I think that's what ultimately made the difference. Well, it was Darren Williams. If Darren Williams is the Mm -hmm. Darren Williams of Utah or even in his first two years in New Jersey or the first year in Brooklyn, if he's that Darren Williams, if he is the top 10 player Darren Williams, the oldness of Garnett and Pierce don't make a factor. But the fact that Mm -hmm. they needed to rely on those two so often to help Joe Johnson, Brooke Lopez win games because Darren Williams would go into a shell and have six points and eight assists, but nothing else. Like, that was the issue. It was it was all on Darren Williams. I'm not trying to hate so on him, but it was him. What do you think that was, was with him? Was it just he could, hand, he could handle the pressure in Utah, but once he went to the Big Apple, it just was not the same? Or do you think he was just aging? It was his ankles. He had terrible ankles. He had to get constant shots in his ankles, and you can see he couldn't dunk after. He had to constantly get spurs shaved down, and that was always reported. He, had, he got orthoscopic surgery. He's going to miss two games and this and that, and that was constant throughout his tenure in Brooklyn, and he couldn't dunk. Darren Williams was yep. a dunker. He was a slasher. He was a high riser. He became a three-point shooter, which was not his game. So that was Darren Williams' issue. And, mm. you know, and you saw it. Even after he left the Nets, it didn't do anything. He was never the same. So, but uh, I, I don't want to talk about that point in Nets history. This point in Nets history okay, is you're, great. You're moving on. You guys have yes. draft picks now. So that's yes, good. but we're switching gears out of basketball. We're jumping into football. Right now, it is the 26th of April. It is a second round going on as we do this, but we're going to talk some first round. Um, do you have any surprise picks coming out of the first round that you saw um, last night? Yeah, Daniel Jones for the New York Giants. <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. They, they probably could have waited. Uh, what did the Giants? They had the sixth pick, and then they had the 17th pick. They probably could have waited beyond the 17th pick to pick Daniel Jones. I don't know why they picked him other than the fact that he looks and plays sort of like Eli Manning. He was my Uh, number five pick, my my number five quarterback ranking, not pick, number five quarterback out of all of them. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, so there's all these players on the board. I mean, Haskins could have gone before him. He should have gone before him. Uh, But, yeah, I I heard – what was it? Sal Palantonio talking today. I think he said that the Giants expect Eli Manning to play another three years. Yeah, and, and you're going to make this kid. Why would you select the number six pick to sit for three years? That makes no sense. None. And not to mention, Josh Rosen is available for a trade, and it sounds like the highest offer teams are getting is like a second or a third round pick. So 
I mean, I would have in a second traded that number six pick for Josh Rosen. I mean, he, what was he drafted second or third overall last year? I mean, you, he's the guy he, he has one year of experience. Nobody other than maybe he has a little bit of attitude issues. Everyone thinks he's going to eventually be a star. I mean, the New England Patriots are talking about trading for him. He just has some injury history. That's what scares you. He's undersized. He has some injury history. But in terms of ball skills, he has everything there. Yeah, he has everything there. He's smart, too. I think, what was he, the highest scoring Wonderlick uh, quarterback last year? He was in the top there, at least. Yeah, and there's always uh, that dumb concern that, oh, he might not be fully into football because he has other interests. Like, are you kidding me? He's not allowed to be a yeah. human. <laughs> like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, and he's. I, I will say, with all these rumors circulating over the last three, four months, I think he's handled it very, very well. Now, he did unfollow the Cardinals. Oh, and, big deal. All that, which is a little immature, but I, considering what he's been through over these last few months, just his ability to keep his mouth shut during that time says a lot about him and his maturity and how much he's grown just in the last year. And why the hell were we making a big difference about who he follows on social media? Why is that such a driving factor? It's awful. It's a driving factor. Like, yeah, you know what? It's cool. Me and you got together via social media, but that's because yep. we're two sports people that wanted to talk. Not who the hell who follows. Like that is just should be unimportant in the, in the world of anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think we follow these players a little too much on social media. That said, Anything Antonio Brown does on social media is hysterical and will create news <laughs> stories for weeks. So he can keep tweeting all he wants. It's very entertaining. Yeah, and the last thing about Daniel Jones, and I know it's been said, but I had to bring it up for any Giants fans listening so I could cringe a little more. A lot of the people probably weren't, weren't really aware for this guy, but the last Duke quarterback to wear a Giant uniform was Dan Brown. and he Or David Brown, Dan, one of them. He was awful. I forget his name, but he was that forgettable to get like two years as the Giants quarterback and he wasted two great years for Chris Calloway the wide receiver so yeah that's what you guys have to look forward to I have Do you one think more. it's because he went to Duke that's why he was drafted because no he was he in the Manning camp people. he went oh, to the yeah, Manning right. camp well, the- that's why and Peyton gave a phone call that's how the Jets got Adam Gase I'm a Jets fan the only reason Adam Gase is the Jets head coach because Peyton Manning called up he's making moves <laughs> Why are they make, taking orders from the Mannings? I mean, look, the Mannings, they have a great reputation, but they're not general managers. They have no track record of being general managers. Why are they, you know, it's just, I don't, if I ran the New York Giants, I would have gotten rid of Eli Manning three years ago. I was saying we should get rid of him three years ago. Why is this still going on? I, I understand the Super Bowl, but look, as a New England Patriots fan, I'm willing to admit those Super Bowls were not won because of Eli Manning. They were won because of the New York Giants defense. <laughs> Eli yeah, Manning made a few plays. Track. Yeah, he made yeah. a few plays, but he wasn't the focal point. No, I really think it's a weird theory of mine that's been going through my head. I feel like these teams, my Jets, Giants, anyone else that takes these notes from Peyton are doing it because they are hoping that keeping this tie to Peyton may one day open up a door to bring him in as a GM, as a coach, as a football personnel guy because he does have a great football mind so i think they're just trying to keep a close tie to him but it could cost them their franchise for a few years so it's a really big gamble (laughs) yeah i I, i'm not sure it's worth the risk especially because look peyton manning i'm sure he would make a good general manager but we just don't know that i mean he could go in there and be terrible he could be phil jackson you never know well i think peyton would care phil jackson just did not care (laughs) that right but I have another surprise pick, and it's a surprise, and it's not as negative as people are making it out to be. Um, mm-hmm. In the number four slot, Oakland select Clelon Farrell, uh, defensive end from Clemson, and it fills a need. They needed a rush end. Khalil Mack's gone, so they wanted to get him. But the thing is, Josh Allen was still on the board, and everyone right. was sure that it was going to be Josh Allen. Now, don't get me wrong. Farrell is a hell of a player. He's a very good player out of Clemson, played high level in the ACC, it's not a bad pick, and I feel like he could develop very nicely. But it's kind of a head-scratcher when you know that Josh Allen is there. They did make two other good picks. They got themselves a running back and, I think, a safety. So Oakland's doing well. But that was a little bit of a head-scratcher. It's not as much of a surprise and not as much of a terrible pick as Daniel Jones, but it was still a surprise. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I like what John Gruden has done this offseason, despite all the issues with his scouting department. But – uh yeah, it sounds like from everything I've heard, they could have gotten Farrell later in the draft or at least traded back or something. And yeah, I, they could have gotten Josh Allen. They could have gotten Rashawn Gary. Uh, there were some other, 
uh, LJ Collier, all sorts of players that probably should have gone ahead of him. Uh, but look, hey, I'm not going to question John Gruden. He, he's he's a character guy. He likes guys who work hard, that are big, that are tough, that can beat players up on the field. So hey, maybe he's just a John Gruden style player. But yeah, I if I were them, I would have traded back. I mean, why waste the fourth overall pick on that when you can probably get him later in the draft? Well, Gruden probably figured that he has like every other pick in the draft, so he might as well use that one. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump in. Uh, best pick. I'm going to go in real quick. I don't have a signatory best pick. I thought a team did well in the first round. Um, the Packers had the number 12 and the number 21 pick, and it's funny you brought up Rashawn Gary because I thought they did a good job in the first round of getting two guys that could be centerpieces on their defense, which was weak last year. Um, Sean Gary, edge rusher from Michigan. He's a little undersized, but if he develops, he can be very good for them. And they fill the fact that they got rid of Ha Ha Quentin Dix by getting Darnell Savage, who isn't a household name yet, but being a Jets fan, I have Jamal Adams. This kid plays exactly like Jamal Adams. He's downhill. He is a hitter. He can blitz, come off the edge, but he can also cover in the slot, which is a little bit more than what Jamal Adams has shown to do. He's not a great slot cover guy. And he ran a 4-3. I thought the Packers did really well to shore up their defense. Do you have your best pick at, at all there? Well, I, I will talk about the Packers because uh, it's something that people aren't really talking about. In the last three drafts, I think it was, maybe even the last four years, in the first two or three rounds, the Green Bay Packers have picked nothing but defensive players. So this idea that they're just not trying to give Aaron Rodgers the defense he deserves, it, they, clearly with their track record, that's what they've been trying to do. The question is, are these slam dunks? Are they going to keep striking out? Uh, but at least they're making an effort. Uh, uh, there's, so all the pressure is still on Aaron Rodgers. Now, I know there's going to be blame going around. Everyone wants to blame everyone but Aaron Rodgers. Uh, but Green Bay really is devoting all their time and effort toward beefing up that defense. We'll see if it works. But you I know, really like these two picks. I really like right. – I think Rashawn Gary at 12 is a good value, and I think Savage at 21 is a very good value as well. Yep. All right, so who do you yeah, got as the best I, I, pick here? Well, as a homer, I'm going to pick Nikhil Harry, New England Patriots, the wide receiver they got out of Arizona State. Now, I will admit I wasn't watching Arizona State football games all the time this past season, uh, but uh, they got off to a good start, and I did see that number one receiver out there, and he really is physical. Uh, not the fastest receiver on the board, but he's the kind of guy that when – Brady is feeling pressure. He can just throw it up in the air, and Harry can catch those 50-50 balls. So, look, Patriots, they lost a lot at wide receiver this past year. Obviously, Gronk's not coming back. I think they it's unusual for Bill Belichick to draft a wide receiver in the first round, but it's also unusual for him to draft a running back in the first round. He picked up Sony Michelle last year. So, I, it's, it's interesting because as NFL teams all start to do one trend, Bill Belichick does the exact opposite. So, Belichick would never draft a running back or a wide receiver early. And other teams started catching on and realized, hey, maybe we should draft offensive linemen. Maybe we should focus on our defense more than these these skill positions. And because of that, now suddenly you're seeing the receiver and the running back position undervalued going into the draft. And another thing is teams over these last couple of years have really spent a lot of money on free agency. Uh, so all those slots that they're filling on those rosters otherwise would have been filled during the draft. So these skill position players at receiver and running back, I think are a lot more valuable than they used to be in past years. Um, I agree with you completely. Um, Nikhil Harry is a awesome pick. And one thing I did notice a trend that I don't know if it's intentional, but one thing I noticed about Bill Belichick when it comes to drafting, there's two things that he likes. He likes SEC and he likes pipelines. And what I mean by pipeline yeah. is you look at Arizona State, you know, you, it's curious. Why the hell would he get a wide receiver out of Arizona State? Then it clicks. Whose coach is Arizona State now? It's Herm Edwards. Herm he Edwards. Herm yeah. Edwards. For how many years with the Jets? He knows the type of coach and the type of player that Herm Edwards creates. And he saw what Herm was able to do with this Arizona State team. He turned them around from like a three-win team to a bowl team. So – he noticed that and that Nikhil Harry was a huge part of that offense. So that's a pipeline thing. And I also noticed with him, um, you know, I'm a Rutgers fan. I'm from Jersey. Rutgers and Florida State are my teams, but I follow Rutgers being, Rutgers being a Jersey guy. And when Greg Schiano was there, 
He's very close mm-hmm. with Greg Schiano. He drafted a bunch of those defensive guys. You saw, you still have the McCordys there, and Logan Ryan was there, and they are all fantastic guys that are coming out of Rutgers. Then he leaves Kyle Flood. Meh. Now Chris Ash is back. I guarantee we're going to see. He knows Chris Ash from Chris being on the Ohio State roster where Schiano was with uh, Urban Meyer. These are all pipeline things. I guarantee you're going to see him draft at least one Rutgers, either player or defensive player in general from this draft because I think he's very big on pipelines and going with what he knows. Oh yeah. He loves Rutgers and he, you'll notice these last few years, he, Bill Belichick has been very heavy on networking with Kirby smart, with Nick Saban, with mm-hmm. urban Meyer, and they're bringing in players from those uh, uh, programs. So yeah, I, Bill Belichick definitely is forming those relationships. He's, he's friends with Herm Edwards. So you're, you're right. That's probably the reason why he, they pick Ari. Uh, with the the last pick of the first round. Without a doubt. So uh, second round of drafts going on right now. We're not really going to touch on that, but there's a lot of good picks going on still. And, you know, it's just the draft is just a lot of fun. I love the draft. I love everything about the draft. And the NFL does it better in any other league. And it's the longest one. So go figure. Um, We're going to jump into baseball real quick. And you had a pet peeve with baseball that I think everyone sees, and I don't know if there's a solution. But when people think of Major League Baseball, sadly enough, and not to offend any of my Phillies fans, friends, they think of Bryce Harper. They have Mm -hmm. no idea that the Mickey Mantle, Lou Gehrig of our generation is playing (laughs) on the Angels, unless you like baseball and sports. Mike Trout should be LeBron James. He really should. Mm -hmm. He is just a monster, but the marketing is absolutely awful in baseball. Would you, what would you do if you were Rob Bamford sitting here banging your head against the wall going, how the hell do I get people to know these guys? Well, there's a few different things I would do. I still think baseball markets teams more than they market players because that's worked historically because it, you're, you go you go to the ballpark because it's a local team and, and you become a fan. And that's how baseball worked for so many years. But now we live in the age of social media where, you, you know, people in the Philippines like the Warriors because of Steph Curry. And baseball needs to have a similar approach. But I think it goes beyond that. Baseball wants to make as much money as they possibly can in the short term. So any content that you view on the Internet uh, has to be through them. So. Uh, they, they monetize their own YouTube videos. If you post any base, like if I were to create a YouTube video and post a highlight or just one pitch from one baseball game, there'd be a copyright strike immediately. Whereas the NBA, they let you just distribute their content everywhere because they know, hey, brand awareness, building up these stars is far more important in the long term than the short term loss we're going to we're not going to have because we're running some commercial on our own platform. And that's what major league baseball does. They have BAM where if you want to go out, watch the highlights, they have some on YouTube, but really you have to go on to MLB.com and watch their own ads and watch it on their own platform so they can make their own money. And because of that, they basically put this virtual paywall between uh, themselves and potential fans. So yeah, I think they should market players more. Uh, Players need to, go heavier on social media like they do in the NBA. But really, I think the biggest problem is Major League Baseball preventing people from distributing their content like the NBA lets people do and like the NFL is increasingly letting fans do. I think that would, without a doubt, make it significantly better being able to just, you know, kind of have it out there. I think another thing is, and it's been brought up, and I know the MLB is trying to really touch on this, but when you look at the MLB, you see a lot of white players, Chinese mm-hmm. players, Japanese players, Dominican players, Puerto Rican players. You do not see a lot of black players. They are, you know, Andrew McCutcheon, Lorenzo Kane. You can really kind of count like the big one, the big stars. And, you know, back in the day, you had so many more. You had Fred McGriff, you had uh, Ken Griffey Jr., you had uh, Chili Davis, you had so many guys, so many guys that you could just, they were all there. And I feel like that's an issue because you look at every other league, you know, especially NFL and NBA, and that's a huge demographic. That's a huge part of the fan base. And their passion for those sports is what really drives a lot of the notoriety. You know, Mm -hmm. the big dunks that happen are so perpetuated where giant home runs and walk-offs are a footnote on social media. And I think it has to do a lot with the distribution as well. But the fact that if you go into 
um, you know, not even just inner cities. You go into suburbia, you'll go to the, the a field where there's a baseball field and basketball courts, and kids are going to be playing basketball. You might have right. a few people tossing a ball around, but it's significantly easier to strap shoes on, get a basketball, and get four other friends together, whatever, six other friends, than it is to get 10 more friends to go play some baseball. I think that right. has a lot to do with the simplicity of the sport comparisons. Yeah, and, and look, I don't think anyone's played stickball for about 40 years. But, yeah, 15 years ago, if you uh, you would have seen people playing wiffle ball at those parks, whether it's in a city or in a suburban area. And, yeah, I think it's going to get worse because the players that are entering the majors now, they were young. They became fans in what I think is the heyday between, you know, 1998, the Maguire-Sosa era, and 2004 when the Red Sox won. And the Yankees dominated during much of that time. That seemed like the heyday of baseball in my lifetime. And you're starting to see a lot of talent coming in from people that grew up with that. But now you're seeing kids. Kids aren't watching baseball now. So where is that talent going to come from 10, 15 years from now? I don't see it. Neither do I. And I also, like, you know, a lot of just, like, little dumb controversies and little minute minute things, I think, drive people off. Like, Hall of Fame voting. All you hear is complaining about Baseball Hall of Fame voting, just how right, bad right. it is. And, how, you know, some unwritten rules. I've ripped on unwritten rules where a guy can't show emotion after hitting a home run. People want to see that. We love the NFL because we watch Dion high step. You know, that's what really got a lot of people into it. They took away celebrating. People were pissed. They can celebrate now in the NFL again. And boom, what do you know? People are enjoying watching the NFL a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, NBA, like you said, it's a, you know, it's a star-driven league. They can show emotion. They can't show up the refs or the other team. But, you know, if there's a big dunk, they can scream a little. You do that in baseball, you get pegged the next time you're around. So I think it's those little minute things. Nobody wants to watch a sport where a bunch of stoic guys go around and hit a ball. It's it's, it's just not as fun looking. Yeah, and a lot of people want to blame it on the older generation as it's like they're these Puritan baseball fans and they don't like it when players show emotion or do bat flips. Well, who cares about bat flips? You're just flipping a bat for two seconds. But I don't think it's that. I think it's the actual players playing right now. Major League Baseball players, particularly pitchers, are the most sensitive human beings on the planet. And they need to get past that because when a player hits a home run and he flips his bat, that is nothing compared to what happens when someone dunks in the NBA or scores a touchdown in the NFL. And I think really this comes down to the players. And I'm okay with brawls. I'm okay with players getting deemed. I think it's entertaining. Baseball gets more attention when that happens. But it's also what happened with Tim Anderson getting suspended uh, the other day because of his bat flip. And this came just weeks after let the, the let the kids play commercial that Major League Baseball put out, which was so poorly done so poorly done <laughs> and, uh, it's it's very frustrating and yeah i think baseball needs to be a little bit more loose and, and what are the teams that win in october it's the teams that have that camaraderie that you know i i think of houston a couple years ago i think of the red sox in 04 everyone grow or everyone growing out their beards and cow- yelling cowboy up and that's that's what makes baseball great is yeah the rally monkey the rally cap those yeah. fun things that you see and we yeah. need more of that. And I'm okay with more pyrotechnics. I'm okay. I don't, I'm not a big fan personally when the NBA does the introductions and they turn out the lights and fire goes everywhere. But if that's what it's going to take to bring people to the ballpark, then do it. I, it doesn't make anything worse. It, it's just an eye roll to some people. It doesn't make your life any worse. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, I really make the comparison like with a guy doing a celebration and then getting hit. Could you imagine? I'm gonna bring Patriots fans for you. Could you imagine Rob Nakovich coming off the end, getting a sack, kind of, you know, doing like a big, like you know, muscle thing, even though he wasn't a showboaty guy, but he did show emotion every once in a while. And then the very next play, he just gets chop blocked for no reason. Like yeah. that would be the equivalent. They take the flag. It's the same thing as taking the warning or getting kicked out, and then that's it. But it's like, could you imagine that happening to players all the time? They celebrate that, and then they get their legs taken out. That would be my equivalent in football. Right, right. Well, look, I, I'm not very optimistic about Major League Baseball going forward. And look, baseball is my original sport. It was the sport that I fell in love with before any other sport. The Red Sox were the team I fell for before any other, other any of the any of the other Boston teams. Uh, but they have a long ways to go. Now they did hire someone to run their social media, and I think whoever that person is, they're doing a really good job. 
Uh, just if you're listening to this, uh, take a look at MLB's Twitter account. It's actually fairly entertaining, but it's got to go beyond that. That same personality has to be reflected in the players, in the broadcasters too. I mean, major league broadcasters are also so boring. And you know, well, I, the Sox have like 19 of them now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There's too many of them. But uh, you know, my girlfriend's a San Francisco Giants fan, and I just fall asleep listening to their games. It's so boring listening to those people talk and you know bring brian scalabrini in there someone i don't know uh yeah. <laughs> make it a little bit more entertaining well yeah just mark my words and i've been saying this for a while major league soccer is going to take over both the nhl and mlb and become the third biggest sport because they are constantly expanding adding new teams and you're on the west coast have you been to a mm-hmm. portland timbers game or one of the games up there in the uh, uh, northwest Seattle Sounders. I haven't, but it, it looks like a New Zealand rugby match. They like are intense. rocking. It's like England yeah. over there in terms they are sold out, they are singing, they are wasted, and it is a great time, and that's exactly – and they keep on doing that, and they keep on expanding, and they keep on getting big names like David Beckham and other guys interested in buying teams. Just It's going to skyrocket, and that is going to be – a lot of these other, t- uh, other leagues are going to be eaten up by the MLS. It's the biggest sport on the planet. It's only a matter of time. Yeah, you know what I would actually do? I mean, younger people are more into Major League Soccer. Um, you know, that, that's where it's all coming from. I like um, soccer. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not the biggest fan. I'm, I'm a, I watch the World Cup and that's about it. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 the standard way of doing things is it, it's sort of the big three sports uh, in high school level is in the fall, there's football. And in the winter, there's basketball. And in the spring, there's baseball. Yep. And soccer has to compete with football. If I ran every high school in the country, I would make soccer a spring sport and try to take over baseball and get some of those football players onto the soccer team. I think that would, first of all, in, in Europe, these guys are starting at like six years old. Like they're being scouted already at such an early age. Everyone yep. in America gets an unfair start. And College soccer isn't anything special. It's so awful. I they think, ruin kids. Yeah, I think it would help develop kids a little better. I think it would bring a little bit more interest to the sport uh, if soccer became a spring sport. Spring sport, and it would probably kill baseball a lot quicker too. Unfortunately, but that's just how it goes. Yeah, the combo of soccer and lacrosse being in that season would definitely kill baseball. It wouldn't even be close for sure. Yep. Uh, all right, Bradley. This was lots of fun, man. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, sure thing, Alex. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Again, that is the host of Whitaker Sports, Bradley James Whitaker. Again, where can people find you on social media? I just look up Whitaker Sports on Facebook or YouTube and uh, on Twitter. My handle is at the Brad Whitaker. The Brad Whitaker. I'm not some imposter. I am the <laughs> Brad Whitaker. Awesome. And again, I'm your host of Sports Opinions Podcast, Alex Cuesta. Find me on Twitter and Instagram at A underscore Cuesta 30. Find Sports Opinions on Twitter at Sports Opinion 30. Instagram, Sports Opinions 30. Visit the Facebook page and type it in on the Google machine, Sports Opinions Podcast, and it will pop up. Or any of your favorite places to listen to podcasts, you can find us. Uh, Once again, this was a Sports Opinions Podcast. Bradley, I really appreciate you coming on again. Everybody, have a go.